Hi everyone, so today we're going to be looking at the industrial society and the new ways of thinking during the industrial revolution. So to begin, we're going to be looking at class life during the industrial age, mainly focusing on the lower class and the new middle class that's established. So first, with the industrial cities, urbanization and especially rapid urbanization occurs. Right. And urbanization, again, remember, that is with people moving from the countryside to the cities, people moving to the cities. The main causes are the changing from the farming economy to a more industrial economy. Remember, the farming techniques and new farming techniques that come out means that people far people don't need the amount of workers on the farms as they did before. So those workers are now out of a job and moving to cities and in order to find work. And those cities are now becoming overpopulated. So with that population, this now breaks down into social classes. You have a wealthy class at the top. Uh, they are mainly the factory owners. You have the middle class who are mainly the managers of the factory. And then you have the poor working class, the group that's doing all of the manual labor uh, at the factories. So this is just an example of on the right, that right picture is an example of what a factory town would have looked like much later, more especially during the second industrial revolution after those new cities have been established. But as you see, you see these uh, smokestacks, right? You see homes, it looks like, are kind of like right next to the factory, all leading to the big factory in the middle. And a lot of the time it was that a factory would spring up first and then the town would then grow around it. So, um, all right, during the first industrial revolution to accommodate the, the growing population, many of the factory owners created what were called boarding houses. And these are mainly just large empty buildings that they then throw like a little shelf, um, little beds and cots around um, that would, um, allow for your bedding uh, and you kind of see a picture on the left here uh, that's what a picture of a boarding or a common lodge would have looked like and many of these people living in these boarding houses the workers would live there the factory owners would make these for them for the workers to live in and many of the people living in these boarding houses would die during the night it was very cold very dark you're huddled together with a bunch of people so diseases could spread quickly so many of these people did die in their sleep but um, boarding houses were used to accommodate that large population influx of workers that would be working in the factory the next day. So with that, these new factories, because they sprang up so quickly, you had no sewage or sanitation systems, and that allowed for waste to collect on the streets. And because of that, you now have uh, the spread of diseases, especially cholera, and because everybody's so tightly packed, it spreads quickly. And um, this is really during that first industrial age. Uh, later on, when these cities are finally established, they start to try to remedy and to fix these problems. But it still persists for a long time. And a lot of people die and get sick for, because of it. Um, also, after, again, being a little bit more established, you have the rise of tenement buildings. Um, Here's some examples of tenements. This is just to show you the inside and outside of a tenement. Um, these are tenements in New York City, just to show you, you know, each window in those buildings in the bottom left, each window is a room itself. You could have an interior, interior room, which could become uh, very, very, very hot, right? So it used to be in earlier tenement designs, you didn't have to have a window in a room, right? Um, you could have an interior room, which would become very hot. Waste would be dumped on the streets or in the back alleys. So it was very nasty and cramped uh, living spaces. And it wasn't uncommon to have eight people living in that um, one little room. And you had all your belongings, that, belongings in there as well. And we'll look more at this when we get to the second Industrial Revolution and Jacob Rees. Jacob Rees, his great work of uh, how the other half lives, and he highlights this problem. Uh, slums, basically, that's what tenements are. Very small, cramped living spaces, and they start to pop up uh, again, even in the second Industrial Revolution, to try to accommodate the large population that's now living in these uh, cities and towns. Um, 
many of these tenement buildings were insulated with hay. So another thing, if a fire caught, it would burn down very quickly. So it became very dangerous. Um, again, very cramped. And um, in the bottom of these tenements, you'd have pubs or a factory store. And in the factory store, it only took factory money. So the factory could then pay workers with its own type of currency, which guaranteed that the factory did not lose any money, right? Because the factory was really just paying them in monopoly money. And, you know, it wasn't good anywhere else, just at the factory store. So that factory store is where you could purchase, you know, a new shirt, bread, milk, that type of stuff. But also with the, the, the pub, there, much of the wages went to the pub because life was not very good and alcohol, alcoholism does take an effect on that population. So it was like each factory had its own town basically set up and uh, it had the people living there uh, at the factory. It had them being paid by with factory money and the people could only really buy things from the factory itself. So it was like an endless cycle, right? The factory benefited in the end and the people were kind of just slaves to the factory. Um, so when you're going to the factory, factory work was very rigorous. You worked from whistle to whistle. This again, it was based on the, the farm system where you work from sunrise to sunset. It wasn't uncommon to work between 12 to 16 hours a day. And if you're doing the math, right? If you're working 16 hours a day, that only leaves about eight hours worth of sleep. But that's if you fall asleep at the bell and then you wake up at the bell, right? So roughly these workers were getting actually an average about of about six hours of sleep a night, which as you may know, is not a very healthy amount of sleep. So because of that lack of sleep and also because of the lack of safety devices, you had many accidents. It wasn't uncommon to have someone lose a limb or a finger, a hand or lose lose their lives because of the machines that are constantly moving, these big, massive machines constantly moving and you couldn't stop them. Nowadays, there are safety devices placed on machines where if you're working on a factory line and something gets stuck, you just have to press a button and the whole line stops. But back then you got stuck and you better hope that it rips away or you get unstuck or then you were gonna become a part of that machine, right? You were gonna be dragged into it and killed. So you have accidents very common back then. You also have exposure to contaminated air. Working in the coal mines, coal miners suffer from what was called black lung. Uh, they were breathing in the coal dust constantly. Their lungs became just basically like one lump of coal. But also working in textile mills, um, because of the lint that was just in the air constantly, you were breathing that in. And just to give you an idea, if you, know, if you ever wash your clothes, and you pull the lint trap that's out of the dryer that you have, that's what your lung would look like after working several years in a textile mill. So that exposure, constant exposure to contaminated air caused lung failure. And many of them at a very young age because you would tend to go and work at these factories or in the mines at a very young age, right around the time that you would enter into school. So six, seven years old, right? So breathing that in by the time that you're 20 you've been, been working in a factory or in the mine for close to 14 years and you're breathing that in you're gonna have some breathing problems right and speaking about young starting at a young age women and children were the preferred workers and mainly because you could pay them less and also they were easier to manage and could adapt to machines quicker um, they could fit into tighter spaces for women, the problem was, you know, the workday, it didn't actually end after the whistle blew. You were then expected to carry out your household duties as well. Uh, same with fathers, but women, a lot of time, the emphasis was placed on them, right? They had to take care of the house. So women got even less sleep than men, which was, you know, horrible when it comes time for work, right? You get up the next day, you were working all day, literally all day long, got home, had to like what make food for your kids maybe and clean the house and do other household duties and by the time you got to sleep it was like well maybe you got four hours of sleep instead of six um with children they had specialty jobs when they went to work especially when they were younger so for little kids it might be you know collecting the lint that uh traps underneath of the weaving machines you also have uh what are called hurriers in mines and these are kids that are basically used to pull the raw materials out of the mine 
uh, before there were such things as automated cars that could do that. So there's an illustration in the top left here of hurriers. So basically there'd be about two kids in front and two kids in the back pushing and they would go up those mine shafts and that cart is loaded with coal and rock. So I mean, these kids were pretty strong, right? But this was a very dangerous job. The shaft could collapse. Um, if one of the kids slipped, the other kids could be crushed to death by the cart. So this was a very, very dangerous job. And the treatment of children, right? Um, you didn't really have a childhood if you were a kid. You were a slave to the machine and a slave to work. And with that, this is especially with lower class children. Uh, before there were laws that said that children, that kids had to go to school, your family really wanted you to work right away. They needed that extra income. So kids were expected to pull their weight and to provide for themselves. Now, during this age, you, ha you now have a middle class, a new middle class popping up. The members of this new middle class are the entrepreneurs, the business, the people who are opening up new businesses, the guys that are coming up with the ideas or, or providing some investment into those ideas. They're the merchants, the people selling things, it's the, the shopkeeper. Um, the lifestyle of a middle class man or family, you know, they had solid, well furnished homes. Uh, this on this picture on the right is just an example of a middle class home and what it would look of what it would have looked like inside. Um, you now have new features to a home, such as a living room where you could go and sit. And this would be an area where in your home today, maybe your family has it, where it's that one room where all the nice stuff is, but nobody's really allowed to go in there. But it's called the living room, right? Probably don't really spend too much time in it or a dining room. You also have features like dumb waiters where there are le these little elevators that would go from like a kitchen to a bedroom, right? And this is so that the family didn't have to get out of, of their or leave their room in order to eat breakfast. And you also have workers do all the work for you. You could, you would have a maid, you would have a cook, you, you would have a butler and those types of features. The impact of the new middle class. So they, they needed to show that they were more distinct and separated from the lower class. So women were not expected to work uh, if they were middle class. A sign of a truly successful middle class husband is that their wife didn't have to do anything. And the less she had to do, the better. When it comes time for the kids, they didn't have to go to work in middle class families. So they were educated and they were expected to follow in the footsteps of their parents. Uh, daughters would be taught how to be good wives, ladylike, right? And that's how they would be educated. And sons would learn the business. The whole point of this was they needed to make sure that everybody knew that they were middle class. So even they wanted to show that they were even better than the upper class because now you have, you have codes of etiquette being created by the middle class. Um, they wanted to make sure that everybody knew that they were there. They were middle class, not lower class. And with their dress, those, their style of dress, they went out in suits so that it showed that they didn't have to get their hands dirty or that they could go in a nice suit. And again, everything was to show that they were different. When it comes time for, for the view of the lower class, they had no, symp no sympathy. Uh, they, they basically had no sympathy, sympathy for them. They believed that it was their fault that they were poor and that by working hard that they could raise their status, that they just worked harder. So because uh, we have these new types of classes, you, ha you now have new industrial uh, philosophies. And we're gonna be moving through this pretty quickly, but these are the new types of ideas that are popping up during this time. So first you have Adam Smith and the idea of the laissez-faire or a free market hands-off economy. And he said that a free market would help everyone and encouraged, he encouraged capitalists to reinvest their profits in new new ventures. He believed that, you know, all right, the wealthy are going to get wealthier, but the wealthy should then use the mo that money to reinvest in everybody. And he believed, you know, the government shouldn't be getting involved in interfering in the economy. So Adam Smith had an idea on how all classes could work together in that way. Thomas Malthus then took this idea um, and and took it and applied it to population. He saw that the population increase, especially in Britain, which was so significant between 1800 and 1850, he said that if it kept on, that the population would outpace the food supply. 
and the poor would suffer because they wouldn't be able to eat. So he urged families to have fewer children. And there's a chart up at the top that shows kind of how his idea works and where his idea, where he came up with his idea. The problem is though that the population did increase during this time, but that also allowed for increase in food production. Uh, living conditions did improve. Families did limit their, their children, the number of children, but it wasn't because of this fear that they would outpace the food supply as Thomas Malthus suggest, suggested. It was more or less that they didn't have to have 20 kids in order to only have five of them survive to adulthood. It used to be that uh, families felt like they needed to have many, many children so that they could have more farm people working on the farm to help them grow food and crops so they could survive. And, you know, it used to be that children were more likely to die at younger ages. So you wanted to have more kids so that more of them would survive and could work on the farm. But within the industrial revolution, they really didn't need more farm hands, right? They didn't need work children working on the farm. So um, they didn't need to have 20 kids in order to have only a few of them survive. Now there are children were living, more children were living past childbirth and also into their teens. So they didn't have to have that many kids. The kids that they were having were surviving. So Malthus was kind of right, but it wasn't all because of the population outpacing the food supply. Now, uh, David Ricardo, he is also talking about the limiting of the population, but it's also the idea of the iron law of wages. He's saying it's not like Malthus, it's actually the complete opposite of Malthus. He's saying that if you increase the wages, right, that allows for family size to outgrow. But that creates unemployment because you have too many workers and not enough work. So what he was saying was um, you need to have a low wage system and that allows for people to work, but it also promotes the idea that someone could like better themselves and, and not, not feel pressured to have many children, right? So Ricardo also came up with several different ideas. He was also a major supporter of the free market system. And he did not agree with a lot of what the laws that Britain was creating uh, during this period to address the issue of you know, poverty. Um, Ricardo was a major promoter in that free market system where the government does not interfere or try to help the poor. He believed that the market would just keep on making more and more money, but you shouldn't be paying workers a large amount, an exorbitant amount of money. You should allow them to do the work and make that money for themselves, but it shouldn't be so much money that they um, feel like they can have more children. Because the moment that they start having more children, their families get bigger, then um, you're going to have m more labor, a surplus of labor, too many workers, and that'll lead to more unemployment. Um, you then also have people that look at uh, the society in general, right? All right, um, not just like economics, but uh, how economics is driving society. Um, but now you have people, it's more of like, they're looking at what's going on in society in general. So you have Jeremy Bentham, Jeremy Bentham, who comes up with the idea of utilitarianism, um, that all actions and laws of a society should be based on the greatest happiness for the greatest number uh, based on utility. Um, so can, you know, can it work for them? You also have John Stuart Mill, who believed that laissez-faire economics favored the strong over the weak and that government, sh he believes government should step in and help those working class people. He kind of challenged and tried to get rid of that David Ricardo idea, right? So he believed that the reforms, you know, should come out, that women and workers should have the right to vote so that they could, they have the power in their own hands. He also called for reforms in child labor and public health so that people could be looked after, especially, you know, the weaker people, children and women. And also he was a big believer that by giving the people the right to vote, that would, that would then it would, uh, be able to, they'd be able to control the big business. So you wouldn't have the power all in the hands of an elite, just the elite. Um, the reactions to this, the middle class rejected this idea, but this was then later, this idea though, was later used by many governments where you have the governments looking after the lower class, okay? And providing healthcare and things like that, of that nature, especially during the 1900s, we'll see the welfare state come into existence, right? 
Um, next, we have socialism. Now, socialism is a new government ideology. It's the idea that the people as a whole should own the means of production. And the means of production is the farms, factories, railways, and other large businesses that produce and distribute goods. So under socialism, they would then give those goods to the government, who would then trade those goods into the greater world economy. And then the money that's made should then go back to the people and benefit all members of society, not just the wealthy business owners. The centralized government is only really existing in socialism to govern and that's about it so socialism was more you know everybody working together and everybody benefiting from that um the government is you know there again to govern but they also determine you know the wants needs and resources of the people uh, another change social change is the idea of utopias in, and utopians utopians especially uh utopian societies start popping up around the world, mainly in Britain and in the United States. And you have Robert Owen. He was a factory owner who believed that he could turn his factory into a perfect utopian society. So he said that in his factories, you know, no child labor would be allowed. He doesn't allow kids to start working on um, who are under the age of 10. You know, if they're under the age of 10, they're not allowed to work. Um, but from 10, 10 onwards, they could. He, uh, you know, his factories, they, they provided schooling in his factories. He also encouraged the formation of labor unions. Uh, so workers coming together, working together so that the workers could then have a, vo a voice. And he uses his new Lanark uh, factory in Scotland as that model society. And it was a very profitable factory. And it showed that a factory could be profitable as well as providing work and living um, conditions work and living conditions that were beneficial to the people, right? Uh, they're better living and working conditions that are substantial to the people. He also provided on-site hospitals, workmen's comp. You know, if his, if his employees were injured, you know, they didn't lose their job. Um, this was common back then um, in other factories. Uh, it was common thing in factories. As soon as you were injured, there was somebody ready to just take your place. There was a line at the door to replace you. So often people didn't call out sick or um, they didn't want to say that they were injured and couldn't work because then that meant that they would lose their jobs. So Robert Owen showed that you could provide good working conditions, provide that workman's compensation if someone got injured and to take care of them and, uh, you know, have them have a position when they got back to work. And by providing good working conditions and that you could still make a profit off of it at the end of the day. So he brings his idea to the United States and establishes or wants to establish a factory called New Harmony, New Harmony in Indiana. And this has not come to complete fruition, but he does bring that idea that a factory could be substantial and make a substantial profit off of treating their workers well. And last but not least, you have Karl Marx. So Karl Marx was a historian and he used economics as the driving force to history. So his idea was that you will have two classes. You have the haves and the have-nots, or the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. The proletariat's like the working class, and the bourgeoisie are the people who own the means of production. Um, they're like the factory owners. Now, Marx traveled all over the world. Same with his buddy, buddy um, Engels, Friedrich Engels. Um, and he helped Karl Marx to write this famous piece of writing called the, the Communist Mani Manifesto. And Friedrich Engels is actually, he's in the United States checking out Shaker communities, which you will probably see when, you, when you're studying US history next year, at some point next year. And um, basically um, at some point, according to Karl Marx, the proletariat will overthrow the bourgeoisie. And that would then allow for a complete communist government, which would allow for everyone to share the means of production and also make a profit off of that make a profit off of owning the means of production. And he says there's a movement though. It has to go from capitalist. You have to go from a capitalist society to more of a socialist society. And then you um, would then move into that perfect communist society. So he was a major opponent against capitalism. He believed that capitalism favored the prosperity of a few over the many. And so keep in mind that you know communism, it's this form of socialism. It's a form of socialism. 
Um, and he believed that there was an inevitable struggle between the social classes, you know, between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, and that ultimately the proletariat would overthrow the bourgeoisie and it would lead to this creation of a classless society where all the means of production, all the, the railways, the businesses, the factories would be owned uh, by the community and all the profit would be shared by the community. Um, so that's going to be it for this lesson uh, for today. Let me know if you have any questions. I'll be sure to try to help you out.